Um, but we welcome Lida. Thanks, Lida, for coming all the way from San Francisco Bay Area to be with us today. Yay, West Coast. Um, if you haven't got a handout, uh, just grab one from the back. Um, so that's something that Lida will, will go through with you throughout the process. So welcome Lida. Lida Toidi has 11 years of experience in digital marketing, strategic planning, and also program uh, management. Um, she has worked with the tech industry, women in tech, um, and her experience with the nonprofit, including with Kiva, working with Kiva and Braven. And she also is very passionate about mindfulness. So if you are interested in doing workshop on mindfulness, uh, connect with Lida later during uh, the after work, after drinks. Um, yeah, and she's, she's very passionate about mindfulness as well as diversity and inclusion. And last year alone, she spoke at 25 uh, conferences and events. So welcome, Lida. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, so just to make sure we're on the right page. Uh, please make sure you have this. And the start point is where it says opportunity, but we'll get into that. So again, hi, thank you for all coming here. I'm Lita. I'm assuming you can hear me because this mic is pretty decently loud. Um, I've worked uh, in really large organizations. I've worked in a couple of nonprofits. I've had a couple of nonprofits as clients. Um, again, it was mentioned, Kiva, Braven, uh, Gladly, um, and the last one has donated over a million dollars uh, to charities alone. So they're pretty impactful organizations. Um, and yeah, today I'm here to give you probably a quite uh, a different lens of marketing for nonprofits than maybe you're used to. So hopefully this will help because again, most of my um, last six years have been in the tech sector. So this all might be a little bit new, but I'll try to make sure we go through each uh, thing one step at a time. And then I'll definitely take questions during the portion that we'll do the worksheet. So I would ask that you take notes for questions and then we will, yeah, I will walk around and answer questions as they come up. All right, awesome. So I always like to share with people how we'll spend our time together. Uh, so that for the next almost an hour, we'll spend some time talking about um, the actual marketing process that ideally you have started, but if not, that's what we're going to do today with our worksheet and uh, with some more information that I'm happy to share with you. Uh, so we'll talk about possible content you could put out, um, who your stakeholders or your donors might be. And again, this might seem like uh, it would be obvious to you, but sometimes it's helpful to just drill down and uh, get a very clear idea of your donor profile. Uh, we'll also talk about channels. Yeah, this sounds good. We'll also talk about channels that you could reach out to your donors through. Um, and then that's when we'll get into this worksheet, uh, double-sided worksheet, and hopefully put all of what we talked about into practice. Um, after which, I'll talk a little bit more about the funnel and marketing metrics in case that's something that is of interest. Um, and I know a lot of this uh, digital marketing uh, lingo might be daunting, so I'll try to break it down. Um, and then marketing tech stack. So uh, Eli mentioned a little bit that uh, they that TechSoup has this great partnership with a lot of tech companies, and I'm gonna give you some of my recommendations for what a, an example marketing tech stack could look like for your nonprofit. And then we'll have time again for Q&A at the end, and also during the portion we'll do the worksheet. So a little more about what your stakeholders or donors process might look like. So there's many ways to slice and dice what a marketing funnel looks like. Uh, this is one of them. So it goes from, let's use, the, yeah, awareness to education to consideration or where you're providing a solution to the point that the person is making a decision or a purchase or in this case might be to actually donate to uh, your cause. So just realize that there are also subcategories under the, these stages, so it's not as clear as you might think as, you know, a donor finds out about you, they are so moved that they donate right on the spot. There's generally many touch points for any marketing funnel, 
regardless of whether you're in the nonprofit space, whether you're a B2B uh, company or a B2C company. And just for by show of hands, does, uh, who works in a nonprofit now? Okay, that's everyone. Who works in a business? Okay, I, there's, there's gonna be information that will be relevant for both. Um, so we'll again touch on some content, we'll touch on who those stakeholders or donors might be and the channels by which to get to them. So this is something that's pretty interesting. I, I've, I find it kind of interesting to think about the fact that a lot of customers have an emotional uh, attachment to brands, whether they're business to consumer brands or business to business brands. And this study was you know, 3,000 people, uh, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. But uh, you could see that there, there are even some brands, especially in the tech space, that you'd be surprised that people have like an emotional connection towards. But it's a lot also to do with the fact that once people have signed up with Cisco or with Marketo or with Salesforce, the opportunity cost of them also getting out of that is so high that there generally needs to be that continuous relationship. So this is just to give you a sense of the fact that uh, it's really great to try to pull at people's heartstrings with nonprofit world, but you're also competing with not only all the other nonprofits out there, but also every single other business that's trying to have that same emotional appeal within marketing. So this is just to show you again that there, though you'd be surprised, there, there are a lot of customers who actually feel emotionally connected to the brands that they buy from. So an ideal scenario is that your donors all also feel emotionally connected to you as a nonprofit. So without further ado, let's get into a little bit more about the customer journey within marketing. So there's a lot on the slide, so I'm gonna try to break it down uh, piece by piece. So this is an example for a business to consumer company. Uh, for most of you, this might seem like uh, a, quite a stretch, but if you think about it, there are a lot of different uh, tactics and channels that are up here on this slide that you may also um, think to use within your nonprofits. So again, let's assume um, you know, like we are a local apparel shop uh, in Vancouver. I know there's a lot of clothing brands, so I won't name any, but just pick your favorite one in your mind. Uh, so we all have our favorite apparel shop. So that's a business to consumer um, business, right? So they're direct to consumer. But when, when there's a, oh, whoops, I think I am, oh, there we go. Let's do business to consumer first, yeah. So when your business to consumer brand, a lot of what people might think is in the awareness stage isn't involved with like social or word of mouth. So maybe you, you just bought some like really well fitting jacket or something or blazer that you're really in love with and you tell your friends uh, in person or you maybe rave about it on social, so that's one uh, very common uh, channel, social media or word of mouth. Another is that people might land on a website um, that you have as a, as a shop. There's also traditional ways of advertising. So for example, there might be a postcard that you know for a specific sale um, and seasonality of uh, the business, there might be a specific sale that you're sending people postcards to. Also, there might be blogs and articles um, that are written up about that apparel store or whatever other business to consumer um, company. Also, there might be like a referral. So I know for a lot of shops, if I were to buy something and to, if I were to refer a friend, I would get a kickback in terms of like a savings on my end and then there would be a savings on uh, my friend's side as well. If there's an app, like if you could think of very large retail uh, shops, there's, they all have apps, so there's that app side of things. And then there's the brick and mortar store. And then everything here that's crossed out is in the B2B space, um, which is business to business. So we'll get into that after this. So just even like if someone has just found out about a new uh, clothing store, there's so many potential ways that you can reach out to this person. So this is just to show you that, again, also as an NGO, you might be thinking of the same old ways to market to your donor, but there's so many possibilities 
to to do so. Um, so in the education space where you're like taking this person on to the deeper and deeper in the, the marketing funnel, uh, there might be a trial session, which again for NGOs generally is not um, relevant, but again, the person might end up on the website, they might go on and read reviews, again, they might refer to uh, blogs and um, articles, maybe they get a re an email from their friend or from the retailer to go out to the, to the store, to the retail shop again. So again, even at this point, like it's a, if it's a very big purchase, if I'm buying like the nec my next ski jacket or something and it's several hundred dollars, there's going to be different steps in the funnel for me as um, a prospective uh, uh, customer to take. So again, maybe I end up again like in the loop of checking out websites, maybe doing some online browsing, checking out even more reviews, reading even more articles and blogs. I know I do, even when you know, it's something that is apparel, like I definitely want to make sure that this thing lasts for, for a while. Um, and then when I finally make the purchase, maybe I just go to the website, I might go to the brick and mortar store, and then sometimes you'll notice that uh, businesses will offer a discount. So there's many types of business to consumer uh, businesses. They are, these are just some of them. So these are some examples of really good um, marketing collateral. And you're not necessarily meant to read all of them, but just to show you, like, um, Spotify tends to have really great personalized uh, marketing collateral that I, I find is really inspirational, regardless of whether you're in, again, NGO space or in, in working in a business. Um, if you are, yeah, Shutterstock also has really great um, marketing. Up by Jawbone or any of these, um, you know, wearable devices tend to have pretty decent marketing. And just to show you that there's so many different ways that you could get a possible co customer, right? You can grab their email on a lead form online. You could target them on Facebook like this um, financial um, retirement planner is, uh, is doing. You could target them on Instagram with Uber or Lyft, which I hope at some point will exist in Vancouver. <laughs> um, you could possibly have a, a referral program. Um, just to show you there's so many ways to get a customer to end up in your funnel and to convert for a business. So let's, if we're going now to the business to business side of things, now it's a little bit, a little bit different, right? So it might be if you put yourself in the, in the headspace of someone who works at a really large um, you know, technology firm, um, this is generally the type of funnel that they're trying to con uh, convert their customers through. So the awareness piece might look like, again, word of mouth. Like I know, for example, for me, my boss was definitely um, a big contributor as to which um, technology uh, solutions we use for our tech stack because that's, that's just kind of the way it is, is that you, you might have uh, somebody um, in upper management who just wants to purchase from a certain um, company. Um, there might be trade shows involved. Again, blogs and articles. Um, webinars are a really big way to also grab leads for people. And you might think, like, that would never work for NGOs. I can tell you it has worked because I've worked with clients and I've gotten them a lot of leads through webinars as well. Um, you just have to make sure you have the right type of topic and the right type of audience. Um, sometimes even white papers sell, like, really well. There's, like... A, um, an example client that I think they sold over a million dollars of business through a white paper that just kept constantly being shared. That's probably not necessarily going to be an area that I would invest in, um, but just know that if you do invest in like thought leadership, then it can really pay dividends. Um, social is a, is a piece is becoming more and more so, but it's definitely, I, w I put it towards the bottom of um, the content side of things because again, you're, this is generally you're trying to convince someone who is at work um, and ideally they're not necessarily on Facebook and Instagram who, and, and uh, being targeted that way. And then last but not least, again, there's traditional advertising. Maybe there's like banners that you put up or billboards um, in order to convince your B2B customer. When you move people down the line, um, it might be again that they land on your website. Um, you'd hope by this point they're definitely on your website, possibly checking out some reports possibly checking out case studies that you have put out as this B2B company. You definitely want to have their email by this point. 
Um, you might invite them to events either at the executive level or maybe webinars for everyone else who you know doesn't necessarily need to be um, attending in person. So again, you're you're getting people to move one step down the line to becoming your customer, which again could be your donor, could be in this case like a B two B client. When someone is considering the solution phase of things, again, there's going to be so much involved with going on the website, getting a product demo, possibly getting a, a presentation from sales staff, um, seeing more case studies, maybe reading even like the report that you got before, maybe even getting a trial, finding out some specs about this, uh, specifications about this technology that you're signing up for. Again, getting like by this point, you're hopefully in someone's email um, loop. And again, there's going to be more opportunities to invite people to events and webinars. And then finally, when you're making this purchase, which tends to be quite a big purchase for um, a B2B customer, uh, you're going to definitely be probably doing some reference checks, finishing up your trial, seeing if you're going to do a pilot with this company. Um, again, finalizing the information that you've received, whether through case studies, webinars, email, and so on. So just to show you, there's so many different channels that you can approach some of which I would say are not necessarily relevant for you, you and your um, nonprofit, which is why we'll soon get to the worksheet part of things so you can decide what are possibly some new um, channels that you've heard of right now that might work for your nonprofit. And again, this, these are some examples of collateral that are for the B2B side of things. So it could be a white paper, uh, it could be an event, um, it could be a webinar, um, it, it could be an ad, uh, possibly on LinkedIn or elsewhere. It could be some thought leadership through uh, an article that you're, you have or like an actual physical um, event or trade show. So again, there's so many different channels to get to your prospective um, donor or your stakeholder who might be your funder. So we went through this. Another thing to note, again, is that this is a pretty long funnel and there's different stakeholders throughout the process. So think about who are your stakeholders along the line. They might be called different things, but at every stage there's gonna be someone who's championing you as the NGO throughout and saying like, this is who we wanna partner with. So they're gonna be involved throughout the, the time. There's gonna be someone usually who's in the C-suite, who might be the CFO, who's you know only involved at the last possible minute because they have to approve the budget or they have to, uh, yeah, just make sure that the the partnership or whatever you're um, uh, you're doing as the NGO with them makes sense. There's going to be some influencers at the company as well. They're usually involved earlier in the in the funnel, and they're probably someone like. Um, in mid-management who is trying to convince their boss and trying to con partner with you as the NGO of whether, again, this partnership, this sponsorship, whatever it might be, makes sense. The user, like the, the end user of, of this might only be involved, and this might not even happen that they're involved to w until um, the partnership or sponsorship has been already decided. And again, the ratifier is usually like, VP of legal or someone who needs to just like sign on the dotted line and make sure that everything is good to go. So again, realize that your buyers or your donors, your stakeholders, they might have different titles, but you need to map out for yourself who these people are and where are their decision points throughout this marketing funnel so that you can, as um, an, a leader in the NGO, um, help move them along as smoothly as possible. Again, usually, if, even if you have the, both functions w within a company, marketing and sales tend to you know, be doing different things, especially uh, considering that marketing tends to be, uh, especially owning the first part of the funnel, and historically sales owns the latter uh, part of the funnel, so you also have to take that into account um, when you're thinking about who your stakeholders are, is whether who are the people who are actually, you need to influence and convince. On the B2C side, again, if we're going back to like a, um, a direct-to-consumer um, company, it's, it's a lot more, 
it's a lot simpler, but it doesn't mean it's easy because the person generally either goes through the funnel and decides, you know, whether this is the right fit for them or not, or usually more likely a lot of people bounce and they don't necessarily um, convert. And again, marketing is quite a beast when it comes to digital marketing. So just realizing that you, you need to double down where there's success and uh, also realize that you, know, you can't do everything. So if, if you're trying to be like on Instagram and also um, getting donors and trying to do like email marketing, there's so many facets of, of digital marketing these days that I would say it pays to know what is the what is going to drive sales for you. So there's like display advertising. So I'm assuming most people know, but uh, who knew that Google Ads will give you ten thousand dollars U.S. Do dollars every month as a nonprofit? Okay, so that's like half of the people. So for the other half of the people, you get one hundred and twenty thousand U.S. dollars for free in Google and display advertising. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be using this. Um, but it's free money, so why not, right? Um, so that could be something that you're deploying, but then you also have to realize like, who on our team has the bandwidth to actually run these ads? Um, do we now have to go and get an agency to run these ads? And that could be something that's worthwhile for you, but just, again, it's a lot of decisions that you need to make based on your specific NGO, your ideal donor, um, and how you're gonna reach them. So that's one thing. If you don't know about it, just if you um, search for Google nonprofits um, and sign up, they try to make it pretty simple. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's one aspect of marketing. There's also like non-branded search again and branded search. All of this you could do on Google, you could do on Yahoo, you could do on um, you know Bing, whatever. But Google is definitely by far the largest um, search engine, uh, at least in North America. Right, once you get into Asia, there's, there's different players like Baidu, but at least for us, um, Google will kind of cover you in terms of this side of things. Again, assuming that you have the resources to um, do this um, and actually like put, put the ads together. Then there's affiliate marketing, which may or may not make sense for you. That's kind of what's known as influencer marketing, which I feel like a lot of people are trying to double down on. I would say for a lot of, I would, generally not recommended unless you have a very clear strategy for how these affiliates or influencers are going to um, recommend your nonprofit and what's actually gonna come out of it. That's just my humble opinion. There's social media marketing, of course, uh, but again, you have to realize what are the platforms that you're gonna play in. I would pick a couple and how you're gonna target your, your ideal um, donors again. Email marketing is something that I feel like a lot of um, NGOs do. Um, one thing I would say is as someone who um, yeah, loves getting like good, um, good emails, I think out of all of the NGOs that I receive emails from, all of them aside from Medicine Sans Frontières emailed me like the Monday before Giving Tuesday. So I had like over a dozen emails being like, please give us money. And then the, pr the, the organization that just thought to do it you know, a week ahead is the one that got the biggest chunk of the money from me, at least. So again, you have to like think of how, like what is the marketing mix that makes sense for you as the NGO and don't necessarily try to follow everybody else because if you follow everybody else, that means you could never really be like leading. So, and it sometimes could be as easy as just sending the email a week before everyone else is sending it, right? So there's a lot of um, pieces that hopefully the worksheet will help you to get clear on. Um, so let's do that before we head into funnel and metrics. I know um, I gave you a lot of information. Um, hopefully this will get distilled um, pretty quickly. So if you go to the worksheet, I'll walk you through it. There's the first page, which is opportunity, uh, which basically means you briefly describe your nonprofit here. But don't describe it like the website describes it. Describe it to me as if we met in an elevator and you had 30 to 60 seconds to pitch me on getting, I don't know, put the sum of money that you want from me in, in your head, like get me to write a check, right? So try to come up with a very compelling um, pitch uh, for what your nonprofit does and what, um, what yeah, basically what uh, differentiates you. 
The customer donor profile, um, this is where I would get very, very granular. I think a lot of you probably think you know who your ideal donor is, but give this person a name. Call this person like Donor Dan, who is our ideal donor, or Donor Dana, who is our ideal donor. And think of a day in the life in this person. Like, what is their gen like? What is their gender? Again, it could be you have a profile for, for both. Like, what's their age? What's what is their job? What are their hobbies? At what time in the day do they, you know, and want to interact with um, an NGO, whether through their email or social? Like, think of really that ideal person. It could be a real person, or you come up with that name and try to give them a, a real identity. On the segmentation piece. Um, try to think of a pie where the middle, the addressable market, is the entire pie, and that's like all of the mark, the funding dollars in all of Canada for all the NGOs, like hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars, right? So that's you probably know those numbers better than I do. But the total addressable market is like the giant pie that you're all sharing. Um, the available market is the the pieces of the pie that are relevant for you as your NGO in whatever space you're in. So insert blank. So the available market is be realistic, like what pieces of the pie can you access? And your beachhead is like, what is the first piece of pie that I want to eat? Whether that's like a grant that is really relevant to us, whether that's a donor that we have had, had our eyes on who's like a super donor. Just think of this as a big pie and where you can kind of slice, slice the pie and eat the piece, first piece of pie. And the last piece on the first page is the burning need that you're helping resolve. I think a lot of times um, NGOs don't think about this in this format, but there is something that you are doing that is obviously resolving um, a need uh, in the market. So if you think of it as a business, um, this is probably where it's going to be easier for you. So if you think of like your unique selling proposition, what is the, the, the thing that differentiates you from the other NGOs who are trying to get the same pieces of the pie, right? Um, so let's start with the first page. And for those who are done really quickly, I will start explaining the second, but I don't want to overwhelm anybody. So does anyone have questions on the instructions for the first page? OK, I will walk around, and I will uh, assist anybody who has questions based on this. So let's spend uh, the next 10 or so minutes on this first page, and then we'll get some brave volunteers from the audience to share and then we'll move on to the second and then we'll get back into marketing funnel and some metrics, okay? Okay, so by the happy chatter in the room, I'm assuming some people are done. So going on to the next page, the flip side, um, you'll see the go-to market. So it's very tech um, lingo purposefully because you are gonna treat your NGO as a product or a service, you know? Um, so what is your go-to market plan? Um, how are you gonna develop that product? And what is what are the finances that will hold that up? So the first one, I showed you a bunch of possible channels and tactics to reach your ideal donor or to partner with your uh, funder or stakeholders. So again, decide on who your end, um, that persona is that you just completed. And what are a few channels, don't like go beyond a few, what are a few channels that you're gonna reach this person? So th at that stage, it could be pretty uh, open. So you could say like, e we're gonna send them emails, or we're gonna send them postcards, or we're gonna invite them to an event, or we will call them and ask them for, for uh, money, right? So the channels could stay pretty um, high level. Relationships, I think this is a piece that a lot of people forget. Um, all of you know a lot, of you know, you have a network, both pers personal and professional. Are there any relationships that you can capitalize on to um, promote your NGO? And it could be, again, on the same channels where you're like, okay, I know this person who has a tremendous, like, social network, so we might not need to be on social media. We'll just use our relationship with this person to highlight our event that we're putting together, for example. So, again, think of some relationships you may have, either personal or professional, that maybe, oh, we know someone who can get us a sponsorship for an event or a discount or something, right? So think of that human capital element of things. And then the strategy is putting the top two together. So um, it could be, yeah, we know um, this person who has a really great social 
media uh, footprint and will get us uh, a discount for this huge venue. Um, and she will uh, help us promote this event that's going to be our main fundraiser for this quarter, right? So get a little more specific into the strategy of what uh, that would look like, what, what channels and what relationships, if any, you're going to leverage. And then get into the competitive landscape, which um, you probably have some idea from the first side of things. Um, but if you were to plot the other NGOs on this um, X and Y axis, which, I mean, you don't have to, it's, there's nothing scientific about it, but maybe like the bigger ones on the right-hand side and the, uh, the middle uh, is for the medium-sized ones, the, the small ones are on the left-hand side, and then the Y axis might be like the, how close the focus is to yours. So maybe you're a nonprofit in the um, environmental space and there's so many others, but just think of what are the big NGOs in that space and where are the ones that have the closest focus to yours and where are the ones that um, are the, the, the furthest in terms of you guys do different things. And this is just helpful to know because sometimes you can actually partner um, with NGOs that might have otherwise been your frenemy until that point. Um, and then product roadmap. So how are you going to roll out um, whatever you had put uh, in terms of your go-to-market plan, right? So we're already Q2. I don't know if you, a lot of you might have different fiscal years, but let's, if, if we're uh, doing the normal business year, then we're already in quarter two out of four quarters. If you're in the other business, uh, the other fiscal year, then you're quarter one. Whatever your fiscal year is, put together four, so from quarter one to quarter four, um, what are the four main actions you're going to take um, to move forward on this plan that you have? And then uh, last but not least, how is this all going to be funded, right? So your assumptions, they could be, we're going to raise X amount of dollars this year, and it's going to be 50% through individual donors and 50% through grants. You know, just make, just have some highlights of assumptions. Um, projections are where you get a little more granular again. You break it down into quarters or cycles where you say, okay, actually, it turns out we're going to need more than this amount from our, uh, our grant right away because our donor event is only in Q3 or something, right? So that's where you're um, really drilling down into what the actual projections of money in the door are going to be. And don't worry if this is not your forte. Um, this is just meant to make it so that it's a lot more uh, tangible so you don't just think of this huge pocket of money and you don't think of how you're going to get there and how that money is going to hit the bank. So at least break it down into ranges that you know about or you've heard of or what is your goal. And then after that, if there's still a gap, what is like what are the funding requirements? Do you still do you need to find another um, grant organization to make up the difference? Do you need to organize another event? Do you need to go after some really big donors? So this is where you're going to realize what is um, what is going to be going all the way from assumptions of like this is what the amount we need to breaking it down into um, quarters of what you think will actually be reasonable, and then the requirements would be anything that still needs to occur to make make up for any gap. Great. So segmentation is important. And that's 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 great because I was sp speaking to someone else in the audience where like you're all tackling very big uh hairy problems and challenges, right? So sometimes you need to break that down into digestible things for people. So if you tell them like we're going to make sure every person in the world is educated, like that to me is great. That's a great vision statement, but then I want you to break it down into the mission statement, break it down into what are we doing this quarter? What are we doing this year? Because again, so I don't know if you know this, but the average uh, attention span of a goldfish is seven seconds. Currently, based on studies, the attention span of someone online is six seconds. So you have to uh, really fight, because uh, we're, we're worse than goldfish now in terms of our attention online, where again, most of the people you're uh, capturing, uh, whether donors or uh, end users or, you know, stakeholders, it's going to be some form of digital media. And if not, it'll probably be your letter in a pile 
along with all other letters. And I can tell you the ones that always stand out for me are the ones that make it very simple for me to understand what are they doing, what do they want from me, how can I help? Like it's really great to have very large, grandiose visions and please keep those top of mind on those hard days when you need inspiration, but also you're fighting with the attention spans of goldfish, so you do have to break it down and simplify it. So thank you, yes, segmentation is important and knowing what to feature when you're reaching out to people in terms of your many uh, service offerings, possibly. Anyone else before we move on? Yes, Eli. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, the competitive landscape actually, again, it's not meant to be like, these are my enemies, I'm going to put them on this page and then I'm, I, you know, you like throw darts at it or something. It's meant to show you how you differentiate from other players in the market. And actually what's great is unlike most uh, organizations, which are businesses where bottom line is dollars and you're literally fighting each other for who can bring in the biggest revenue in the NGO space a lot of times I am surprised that there aren't more partnerships because you are going after the same usually triple bottom line and usually your offering um, is so similar that I'm just more surprised that there aren't more partnerships so this is meant to both show you like who yeah who's a competitor, but who is also a possible partner? Like I know for myself in the women in tech space, um, so I've been living in San Francisco for the last five years, and when I went there, I was really shocked because the one thing that really surprised me is like the total lack of diversity, like in gender, race, everything. Like it's like the center of innovation, yet everyone is like a 25-year-old dude who went to Stanford. Which I have nothing wrong with that, but it's like you have zero diversity of thought when you have everyone that did the same degrees, had the same profs, like went to the same, you know, parties. Um, so I would, you know, I would go to events and I would just like feel out of place. And then that's why I went to a lot of women in tech events. But then I noticed there's all these silos within women in tech. And then even someone told me like, oh, why would we partner with someone? They're fighting for the same audience. I'm like, isn't the whole point like to increase diversity and like inclusion in this space? Um, and I really made it my mission to try to get people to partner and not replicate each other's work over and over and over again. So if that could be a lesson to you, please try to see this competitive landscape as like a friendly, uh, friendly thing. And that possibly at some point your and other NGO friends could actually help you um, and you could help each other, whether it's like cross promoting an event or um, doing like a, fundraising event together or whatever it might be, um, helping each other out is, yeah, is definitely a possibility. So thank you. So we'll get into a little bit more about funnel and metrics. Um, in the interest of time, we're g I'm going to go pretty quickly, but you all have my email at the bottom of this uh, worksheet. So if you have any questions after, you can either ask them at the social or you can always email me. So this is just to show you like B2B marketing or just any type of marketing that you're going to do online is going to be quite complicated. There's like the opportunity, um, there's the account, which is like the, the actual um, company or like your, maybe your stakeholder here, and then all these contacts, and then they're going to get, you know, there's different channels possibly that they're going to come through. There's different campaigns that they're going to see, and this is actually not that much. This is probably like 40 people's information. So just like think of this, um, and so it's actually much better, I would say, rather than trying to play on all channels and do events and try to rank high on search engine optimization and do really great email marketing and try to do like organic out outreach and do webinars, I would start with like two and then work my way up to three and then work my way up to four, then five. Because otherwise all of these things are, you're gonna lose not necessarily, I would just say you're gonna lose some resources in trying to spread yourself thin, where I would much rather double down on what is proving to succeed and layering on more complexity when needed. Here are some quick uh, metrics and key performance indicators to get started that 
you know, you probably have heard of, and if not, you probably uh, will hear of at some point, but um, obviously, anytime you're putting together an event, um, it's like, what is that cost? What is your marketing investment? Um, impressions are uh, how many people actually get to see this ad or this post or um, all of this. And again, if any of you have gone into the analytics back end of any of these tools, you've probably seen all this where you go onto like LinkedIn posts or Facebook posts or whatever, and you're like, what does the impressions mean? Uh, so it's like how many people have actually seen that? Um, clicks and click-through rate are based on the number of people actually click and engage with that content. Site visitor is pretty self-explanatory, how many people have landed on your site. Conversion rate is maybe perhaps how many people have donated or whatever conversion event has occurred, which for most NGOs is that they donated or they called you or they came to an event. So this is up to you to decide what is that conversion. Maybe what is the, I, the um, absolute number in terms of revenue or in your case donations. Maybe what is your target cost per acquisition if you're going to do paid marketing. Um, so if you're going to do that, you know, use your free Google ads. Um, what is the target cost per acquisition? How much are you willing to spend for someone to actually see this ad and engage with it? What is your return on investment? I think this, uh, out of all of them, this is the most um, tangible across fields. How much money am I putting into the system and how much money is coming out? Or it could be how much effort am I putting into the system and what is coming out? So it's not always dollars and cents, but always realize what is our return on investment? We organized this event. It took 100 hours to put together. Our goal was to have 500 people and we had 20. Like, you know, so that's like worst case scenario. Or maybe the con conversely, the, what happened is we put this event together. We thought we'd get 50 people and we got 100. So what could we do to double down and, and make sure that we keep up the success? Or in the first case, what, what went wrong and how can we prevent that in the future? And this is, again, another very crowded slide on purpose to show you if you're trying to be, like I, I'm a marketer, I've been doing this for 11 years, okay? I cannot know all of the marketing technology landscape. And this is a slide from three years ago, um, this actual graphic. If we're gonna, I tried to put the 2019 one and it would have been even more blurry. So just to show you, like you're not meant to become the jack or jill of all trades and know everything about everything in marketing. Because even as a marketer, I can tell you that is impossible. What you're trying to do is to f find the tools in there that make sense for you and make sure that you capitalize on them and definitely use TechSoup um, and Eli's connection with them to def I, w I wish I could get <laughs> those rates because I could tell you I have to pay full price as someone who doesn't uh, run an NGO. So definitely make sure you get your NGO rates for these. So trying to distill that for you, hopefully this is a much more um, digestible slide. So this is what I would highly recommend as an example uh, marketing tech stack when you're starting out. So MailChimp is pretty decent. There's a lot of other competitors like Constant Contact. Just any email service provider that is free for the first couple of thousand contacts Whoever it is, is fine. MailChimp is pretty good because they also allow you to uh, do landing pages. There's a lot of features that they have that are pretty good considering that I, you know, um, I didn't have to pay for my personal MailChimp for a while because I, did, I had like 1,400 contacts and they only charge at 2,000, let's say. So even for personal like um, emails, I have them all within MailChimp because it just makes my life a lot easier. Google Ads, make sure if you're going to do anything with Google that you get your entire um, credit. So it's like 120K a year, um, US dollars, so it's pretty decent. Copper is a new um, tool out there that's also uh, freemium in the sense that it's free for a while for um, if you're storing a lot of people's information and it's going beyond what you need on MailChimp and you want to you know, send people personalized emails that you don't actually have to type out their names and you can tokenize things. Um, that is where I would recommend Copper and or HubSpot. Um, so I've used HubSpot uh, to do a lot of these things. So you can also use this for your marketing automation system and or your customer relationship management system. Again, 
What it means is you put a bunch of people's information in one place, possibly your donors, and then you s are able to email blast or do anything, send them postcards, whatever it is, um, and get all of the data back uh, in one spot. If you end up wanting to you know, rank high for um, on Google and you want to do so f for free uh, rather than paying for Google Ads, uh, I would use a tool called Moz um, for SEO. Intercom is great for chat or in-app messaging. If you have an app, which I guess a lot of people don't, but if you have, for example, ever seen that there's a chat function that pops up when you're on a website, that's commonly something like Intercom. There's also cheaper varieties of this, so I would always just do Intercom alternatives if you want to look for cheaper ones. Um, Optimizely is when you're doing things like A-B testing, you are getting different campaigns and you kind of like, this is basically from the beginning to the end is like the more advanced you get into marketing. Um, so you could start here and just like end your day and that's fine and then the next m like quarter you might do this and then you know. Um, so optimize these if you get to the point where you're doing a lot of experimentation and A-B testing. Ad rolls for retargeting if again you're using Google Ads and you want to retarget people, this is a great tool. Um, Radius is great for data management and predictive. When and if you're ready, don't feel like you need to use any of these tools um, earlier than you need to. But again, I hope it's slightly better than this kind of situation where you're like, I don't know what I need to do. I feel like marketing is so uh, intense, and it is, and don't feel like you need to understand it all or know everything because that's going to be quite challenging as it's changing you know, very quickly, at the speed of light, almost it seems like. And again, remember that though you have the hard days, um, tech and startups and uh, nonprofit land are very similar in the sense that we have very ambiguous situations. There's a lot of changes. We could run out of money any day. So though I stand here and I've worked with mostly tech uh, startups in the last um, several years, I can tell you that I definitely um, empathize with you in the sense that it takes a lot of grit, it takes a lot of perseverance to do what you do every day. So I commend you for everything that you do. And it, if it does feel challenging, just realize that you are embarking on something that is much bigger than you or anyone in this room. So just realize that you do have a lot of ownership. Um, and yeah, a career in nonprofits is a pretty sweet place to be. And I think that's it. So I stayed within time. So thank you so much for being here today and uh, yeah, I'll take any questions at social hour. Thank you. <laughs>